Good evening. On behalf of the entire New College community, our lectures trustees, our board and staff, collegians residing here and those at New College Postgraduate Village across the road, and our 7,000 alumni, may I begin by warmly welcoming everybody who is here with us this evening. For those returning from last night, welcome back. For those joining us for the first time, a warm welcome. My welcome this evening will be considerably briefer as I will not be repeating my welcome to distinguished guests and acknowledging apologies as I did last night. The recording of last night's lecture is already available on our website and my full introduction and welcome are available there. In spite of the minor challenges of teleconferencing, last night we shared a thought-provoking time discussing approaches to caring for individuals in times of crisis and stress. Dr Brown took us on an amazing trek. We clambered from one mountaintop to another to gain different perspective on the nurture of the individual. She dived down and clambered it up, dragging us behind us across this broad area of human endeavour that's developed over the last 140 years or so. We love to talk about the evidence base and Dr Brown was extremely careful to refer to this in the views she expressed. We have two colleges here at the University of New South Wales and the university is one of the most highly ranked internationally. New College, now in its 53rd year, is home to 247 undergraduate students and has an impressive history of graduates who have achieved first in their degree and a much, much greater number who have gone on to be leaders in their fields. New College Postgraduate Village is home to 315 postgraduate and senior undergraduate students. Now in its 13th year, it has produced over 100 doctorates at the University of New South Wales, again, a community that's producing many future international leaders each year. Both colleges enjoy a national reputation for their caring environments, their vibrant communities and their academic accomplishments. Three core aspects of college which we value and cultivate with the student leadership teams so that we can best support and care for those who live, for, live with us. As I said last night, the senior staff continue to innovate with the student leadership teams on how the entire community can best support and care for individuals who live with us. This second lecture is of special significance to the new college communities. This may seem strange to you, but our large communities are broken down into little families, according to the physical wings of the college buildings. It's only the most outrageous extrovert who is capable of relating to more than 250 people at a time. So our pastoral framework is structured around little families in which everyone can form friendships and feel valued within a much larger community. Also, all of us will have had a unique family experience and for many of us, forming a family is something that's yet to happen. Our lecture tonight will be special. Before we commence our time together this evening, I wish to make three acknowledgements. The first is to those who've lost close members of family during COVID. There are several people in our colleges here, as well as people who've had to leave us to care for their grieving families elsewhere. The second is the Bedigal people, traditional custodians of this land. We continue to pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and extend that to other Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present with us this evening. I acknowledge my fellow New College Lecture Trustees, the Right Reverend Dr Michael Stead, Bishop of South Sydney, and Professor David Cohen, President of the UNSW Academic Board. Questions. As I said last night, we love questions at the New College Lectures. Attendees peppered Dr Brown with questions last night and I imagine we'll do again the, the same again this evening. So please, just open your browser and go to Slido, SLI.do, six letters, press enter, and then type in the hashtag NCL2021, that is NCL2021, seven letters and, and numbers, and you'll be at the question interface and you can, you can put your question there. Before we start, I'd just like to pray very briefly. Dear Heavenly Father, as we meet here again this evening, we thank you for the freedom we have in this country to discuss crucial matters of life and love without fear. We ask again for your blessing upon our lecturer this evening, that you grant her clarity of thought and expression. Please grant to us all knowledge of you 
and a better understanding of you and your ways in this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please join me in inviting Dr. Jenny Brown to address us this evening. Well, it's good to be back. And thank you very much for a welcome again, adjunct professor and master of New College, um, Professor Pearson. I am starting this evening really energized because of the excellent questions that came my way yesterday. And I look forward very much to some incisive questions to dialogue with this evening. Tonight's topic, the nurturing family, it will flow on well from what we tackled yesterday. Lecture one opened up the questions, are our mainstream mental health treatments sufficiently supporting growth and learning? Growth and learning, the two key elements of the word nurture. And I particularly looked at this trend of outsourcing to experts in the mental health treatment world. And I asked, are there other sources of nurture in family and community that are not being adequately utilised? And tonight, I really want to think about the family, tomorrow, community and church, but thinking about how to better garner nurturing within the family in this lecture, I'm going to be exploring what is nurture in the family, but in particular, I'm looking at parenting. I'm looking at parenting children, one generation to the next, and how can helpers best facilitate nurturing for parents of their children. I will reflect on the current mental health situation amongst children and young people, particularly the impact of the pandemic. I referred to it briefly yesterday. I'll expand it a little bit more tonight, particularly the current news we're getting about the issue of self-harm. I'm looking as well tonight at the topic of intensive parenting. Have you heard quite a bit about the terms helicopter parenting? A, a new one I heard recently, snow shovel parenting. That was a new one to me. I want to investigate a broad historic lens to understand the emergence of intensive parenting because I think this trend has been an impairment to the development of nurturing within the family. So I'm going to take another historical tour. I think it presents a real challenge for parents to deal with all the advice out there from experts to know how to nurture well in the family. And one of the things I want to assure parents who are listening, and I'm a parent myself and a grandparent now, I want to assure parents that this will not be a guilt trip. There's enough guilt laden upon parents and mothers in particular, backed up by the literature. And I want this to be an exploration that opens up better empathy and compassion for what parents are up against in 2021. I'll be speaking from diverse vantage points. It will be another tour up and down mountaintops looking over various viewpoints. And the vantage points that I'm drawing from are my clinical practice, my training and supervision experience. And tonight I will be giving you an overview of my research interest in the involvement of parents in their adolescents' mental health treatment. I will start by, as I did last night, declaring my theoretical bias and giving you a sense of Dr. Murray Bowen's family systems theory that does inform a lot of my clinical practice. As I said last night, but I know some of you are new tonight to the lecture, the key 
element of Bowen theory is that relationships are central to nurture. But relationships can bring out our best and they can bring out our worst. And in our relationships, we can be nurturing and we can very often without realising it, be impinging on others. And it isn't helpfully bringing nurture to our relationships. And Dr Murray Bowen's research and writings have been very helpful for me and others. It's been the work of the Family Systems Institute that I've been involved in for over 18 years now to bring this theory to the community, the professional community and the general community. I have put on this slide a quote of Bowen's that is a little different from my introduction to Dr. Murray Bowen last night. It's a quote that really outlines where I'm going tonight. The favourable results with parents came when they could make a project out of themselves, not their children. And this was for Bowen in his NIMH research study of whole families in a treatment unit. He could see that this was a real turning point in the direction of recovering nurture in the family. So just pause and have a think about that. We'll be looking at it tonight from various vantage points. What does it take to shift the focus away from trying to make the child who we think they should be or to fix the child and to shift it around to how can I make a project out of being the best resource possible for a nurturing environment for the people in my family that I care about. As I did last night, let me start with a case example from clinical practice. It is a de-identified case, a family case. The, it's a composite of many family stories just like this one. And I'm going to call this family the Simpson family. That's probably unfortunate. I didn't realise it until right at this minute that I chose that name, but there it is. Probably it's quite pertinent because we're so, we appreciate the humanity of the Simpsons, don't we? But this is not a humorous story at all. This is a really challenging story for this family. They have four children and their second child showed a giftedness in sport. They were, because of their special giftedness, particularly positively focused upon and supported to attend an elite academy in the middle of high school. They moved away from home and at that point of moving away from the family, they had a significant collapse in their functioning. The symptoms were an eating disorder, depression, and the next few years after this collapse saw this young person go in and out of many different treatments and included hospitalisation, suicidality, various diagnoses, a very challenging situation for any family and for parents. I first heard from this family through the father. He contacted me, having read a little bit about family systems approaches, and I began to just work with he and his wife. I never met the symptomatic young person. Just working with the parents. You can imagine that this young woman was completely exhausted and burnt out from all the treatment and therapy, so was quite relieved that I wasn't inviting her to come along to therapy. That doesn't mean I don't sometimes do family therapy and invite the child there. But in this instance, and in many instances, I'm keen to work to help the parents find their way back to confidence when they're facing this kind of helplessness. And that's what it was like for this family. So how did we start work together? First of all, investigating the timeline of the family story from the parents coming together they're leaving home and just factually laying out the details of the family's life. 
not passing judgment, not giving interpretations, just telling a story. And every family has a complex and challenging story to tell. And it really calms people down to just lay out the facts and consider what they've been up against, what they've had to adapt to along the way. And from there, we look together at the interactions that they could report on with their daughter. They could begin to think about were their interactions truly nurturing for their daughter or were they inadvertently in the way they were responding moving into over-rescuing or a parenting tension developing between the father and the mother that the child was getting caught in. And together, side by side, we began a thoughtful researching process where they might be able to discover different ways to respond to their daughter's reactions. Was there a different paradigm of nurture that might take this whole family down a path of growth, not the helplessness and despair that presented to me when I first met them. And I'm going to return to the story of this family at the end of the lecture. But I hope that you're already beginning to think about the treatments that are on offer for families in this situation, or perhaps in less acute presentations and worries about their children. Are the treatments on offer assisting parents in nurturing a child or an adolescent or a young adult's coping skills, their coping capacities. Let's turn now, different vantage point, to asking is there truly a crisis in children's coping capacities? What's the current state of children and young people's mental health, particularly amidst this pandemic? I mentioned yesterday some stats from the World Health Organization looking at 10 years of data pre-pandemic and 20% of the world's children and adolescents in 2017 present or could be identified as having a mental health condition, 20%. What about the pandemic? What about the effect of lockdowns? Have you been seeing the press on the alarming statistics on child and adolescent self-harm? How do we make sense of that? Just a couple of weeks ago, at the end of August, there were reports in the various newspapers. I particularly focused on the Sydney Morning Herald on August 29 that reported that more than 40 New South Wales children and teenagers are rushed to hospital for self-harm every day. And up to 31% of children, this is up 31% from the last year. It's quite striking, isn't it, to consider that the presentations for self-harm and emergency during this pandemic year and are 31% up on last year. Recently, just last week, there was a Growing Up in Australia report on self-injury amongst adolescents. And I have a slide to give you a sense of the data that is presented in this report. What it shows you here are the difference between thoughts versus acts of self-injury the green are the thoughts of self-injury, the blue are the acts of self-injury. And to give you a sense of what this picture is revealing, the New South Wales suicide monitoring system show that 17 people under the age of 18 are believed to have died from suicide in the first six months of this year, compared to 13 in the first half of the previous year. These are very concerning statistics. And with that, the, just pause to imagine the grief and the pain of the families impacted 
in these terrible losses of young people. And this statistic is different to the whole population statistics during COVID that I mentioned yesterday, where over the entire population, there hasn't been an increase in suicide rates during the pandemic. Self-harm amongst adolescents has been increasing in the Western world for the past decade. It's not new, but the impact of the pandemic has come on top of this long-term trend. Christine Morgan, the Chief Executive of the National Mental Health Commission has said that there is a need to equip parents to help because they were akin to frontline workers. And it had me pause to consider what is happening at the front line? What is it like in the emergency departments at the moment? And do we really want parents to be in that environment in the highly anxious front line? And what I've done in preparing this lecture, I've written to some of my colleagues that I know who work in senior positions overseeing emergency departments and other departments of psychological medicine in our healthcare system. And I've asked them some questions to bring to this lecture. And I particularly wanted to know from the frontline experience what they think the impact of the pandemic has been on children and young people. The symptoms of concern, they tell me, are intensified or amplified presentations of what was going on before. It's not new. It's not caused by lockdown and pandemic fears and anxieties, but it's amplified. So what I see here and illustrated in this next slide in looking at the literature and talking to my colleagues is that lockdown has created a pressure cooker effect. There's an intensification of existing family tensions, vulnerabilities and risks. And particularly look at this notion on the slide here of involuntary protect, protracted time together Think about that, we haven't had a choice about it. And families who are already struggling with heightened tension and anxiety and stress to not have a choice about being shut down and locked down creates an understandable amplification of vulnerabilities and enormous pressure. Here are some quotes from the psychiatrist colleagues that have written back to me that I think are pause for a good thought and I'm just reading their comments, comments here. I think it's a combination, this pandemic, of community distress and a lack of available places to seek support and the intensity of distress that are bringing people into emergency departments. However, the recurrent pre presentations are also coming back multiple times. So note from that that many of the presentations to emergency departments are returning, uh, a continuation. The psychiatrists reflect on the lack of school structure, the lack of social support, and the intense family relationships. The other comment that I've received from my colleagues is that these presentations are occurring at both ends of town. The eastern suburbs are just as impacted as the west. Girls are much more in the presentation of self-harm than boys. Girls are more likely to self-harm and ingest. Boys more likely to act out and break rules. And hence they show up differently in the mental health statistics. The increase is across subspecialty areas as well, not just self-harm, eating disorders increasing, functional neurological disorders increasing, and gender dysphoria clinics as well. Another comment from a different psychiatrist, and my heading for this comment is anxious parents, anxious services. 
The stress and anxiety reverberates through these vulnerable systems, she writes. And it is often emergency services who are called to share in the intensity. The inevitable result of anxious ambulance service people, emergency hospital nurses and staff is a highly reactive decision-making experience that involves very little thought, no time for thinking before the next crisis is happening right in front of them. Think about the impact of stress on these health services. But I'm also thinking tonight about carrying over from yesterday, so many of our, the focus of new expenditure and service delivery is going into acute services, not prevention, not the primary baseline nurturing services. And I think that's a concern to ponder tonight. In my own research, I was working at a tertiary treatment center and, be, and a researcher there. And at the time I finished my research interviewing parents, that particular service, it was a child and family service for adolescents, it closed down and the money from that service was diverted to creating more acute care beds for adolescents. And that was back in 2011, and that trend continues. As I mentioned last night, protective factors are not talked about as much in mental health discourse and thinking about COVID. And it is worth pausing again to consider that pre-COVID experiences of a steady, stable home mitigate against COVID-related stressors. And some families are adapting to stressors well during the pandemic. In preparing for tonight, I thought of a family that I've been working with for some time. And during the pandemic, our telehealth sessions have focused on the parents and how they're adapting. And I've noticed that they've turned their attention away from concern about their children to stepping back a little bit more and saying, I think it's time to address issues in our marriage that could be better. They have found this time has given them a reset and they've had the space to think about not where the symptoms might have been with their children in the past, but here's a time where we can improve our marriage. And there are many stories like that during lockdown. But as I present a little bit of a snapshot of child and adolescent mental health in this current pandemic, can you hear a repeated word? Is there one that stands out for you? For me, it's intensity, that pressure cooker again. I hear it from my colleagues. I hear it from my clients. Intensity, which sits on a continuum. We all are experiencing a little more intensity during lockdown than usual. But on that continuum, the intensity factor is worth considering and how it gets in the way of nurture. Is anxious intensity a trend in parenting? Or is it something newer that has particularly been brought to the surface during the pandemic? Have children and young people become less able to manage life stressors in the intensity of parenting and the intensity of society? Let me turn briefly to university and college student research, pertinent for a new college lecture. There's an article that grabbed my attention called A Suffering Generation factors contributing to mental health crises in North American higher education, published in College Quarterly 2013, and a couple of quotes that stood out in this article. First, the hovering, nervous, anxious, far too involved helicopter parents, as one counselor described them, have elevated expectations for their children. 
interesting. There's the helicopter parent idea. Another quote, the dependence on social technology is partly to blame for students' inability to handle social pressures and the increased responsibility that accompanies university life. Do these quotes resonate with you, those of you involved in higher education? What I want to do drawing out of these slides is consider this idea of parent intensity, the helicopter parenting phenomenon, parent overprotection. And I have a slide that just brings to notice some of the key research developing in this area of parent high involvement for children. What this introduces is the idea that you can over nurture children. Too much nurture impedes a child's growth in their capacity to manage life stressors. There's a good deal of literature out there that has been grounded in theories of attachment that always talks about the problem of caretaker deprivation and parental deprivation, maternal deprivation in particular. But there's a growing body of research, particularly investigating children's anxiety disorders, that is looking at the factor of parent over-involvement in rendering children more susceptible to developing problems with anxiety. And as you can see from this quote down the bottom there, that the problem with parents becoming over-involved in rescuing and helping and nurturing their children is that it increases threat avoidance for children and young people. And we need to face threats and stress that is activated from lots of smaller and medium threats on a daily basis through life. Even for young children, the, the threat experience of separation from a parent is essential for a child to learn how to calm themselves down, bringing out some of the co-regulation of the parent as well, but the beginning developmental necessity of learning how to deal with the stress response and resetting that. And over-involved parenting crowds out that possibility there are lots of current critiques of these parenting trends. And again, I said at the beginning, I don't want to take parents on a guilt trip. And some parents might now be questioning, where am I taking them? Particularly with all of the dialogue about helicopter parenting, over-involved parenting. And I do want to move to understanding how society is contributing to this trend and how difficult it is for parents to know the right balance of nurture in their parenting and nurturing and development of young people. But a couple of quotes that I think are really pertinent that are out there in the public discourse from very important books that are bestsellers the first one is one I'm reading at the moment, Ben Sass's The Vanishing American Adult, published in 2017. And he writes, we the parents have been failing to transmit the age old truth that scar tissue is the foundation of future character. And then uh, the, the book, The Coddling of the American Mind by Lukanoff and Haight that was uh, published in 2018. Have, have any of you had the opportunity to read some of their work? What they speak to is a passivity growing in the, the realm of parenting and responding to young people. And they write, the resulting culture of safetyism interesting word, safetyism, interferes with young people's social, 
emotional and intellectual development. It makes it harder for them to become autonomous adults who are able to navigate the bumpy road of life. These authors write of three terrible ideas that have become increasingly woven into American childhood and education. And here they are. Ask yourselves, can we see them here in Australia? Here are the terrible ideas presented. Number one, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Number two, always trust your feelings. Number three, Life is a battle between good people and evil people. And they write, these three great untruths contradict basic psychological principles about well-being and ancient wisdom from many cultures. It's quite something to consider the direction we're going in as a society when it comes to the nurture of young people. This increased anxiety and insecurity in parents and possibly educators as well, what is going on? We're going to now take a different direction, the historical backdrop to the anxious parent. Yesterday, I looked at a historical backdrop to the development of mental health treatment over the 20th century. And what I've done in preparing for this lecture is looked more closely to the history of parenting and parenting wisdom and advice over the 20th century and into our current century. And you can follow it along in this slide that parenting in the 20th century in particular has increasingly become a professional academic domain. And what's the impact of that for parent confidence? The 20th century parent has moved from being, during the 20th century, parenting, the word parent has moved from being a noun, something that one is, to being a verb, something one does. The dominant discourse representing parents out there is that they need expert advice and support. And I start this historical journey in the 1920s. Professor Peter Stearns of George Mason University, a social historian, has written a lot of articles on parenting over time. He wrote a book called Anxious Parenting. And in this book, he said that the 20th century, once rated as the century of the child, became rather a century of anxiety about parents' own adequacy. A century of anxiety about parents' adequacy. And he noted that the biggest spike in indicators of parent anxiety about their adequacy coincided with the publication of the very first parent manuals that written by professionals that were burgeoning in the 1920s. In the 19th century, with the few child-rearing manuals that are out there, they prioritize character development and parenting goals that were connected with moral development. And happiness got a mention, but only as it related to character development. But in the 20th century, chapters of parenting books changed in their themes. They began to be devoted explicitly to the need to promote children's happiness, even in many accounts at the expense of discipline. In the 1930s, in the pre-war period, there was already a shift away from looking at the broader social context of the experience of the child to looking at their psychology. And certainly, the moving on from that in the post-war period, there's this move towards cognitively focused parenting. So looking away from 
the accounts of the child's whole social context, spiritual context, and moving to the development of the child's intellect and the psychology of the child. Now, some of this clearly has been a contribution that's been helpful to many parents and many people in the field. But what I'm wanting to lay out here is the journey and the trends and think about how they've contributed to the helicopter parenting of today, to the confused, anxious, guilt-laden parenting that has become pervasive. With cognitively focused parent, parenting, not only parents are expected to nourish, shelter, and attend to their children's physical and emotional needs, they're also deemed responsible for their intellectual development. And there are changes in discipline methods over time in the parenting literature, and they reflect expert-guided parenting discourses. The rise of the parenting expert over the last 100 plus years we have seen a generational change in discipline methods that are reflecting expert guided parenting discourses. And moving to more recent times, the 1990s, in the literature, it has been deemed the decade of the brain. A writer in 1999 said that when new research in the field of neuroscience identified infancy and early childhood as critical periods of development of the brain, parenting inadequacy increased even more. And I want to invite you now to look at this next slide as a parent or an educator and to consider what impact it has for you on your adequacy to be able to nurture young people. I just want to give you a picture of pulling off the internet some of the pictures that are presented to parents on the development of their child's brain. It's a little distorted, I can see that slide, but I, I wanted to give you the experience of seeing these MRI images of children's brains and thinking about children and babies' brain developments. I remember visiting not long ago, a few years ago, my daughter in the US after the arrival of a, a new baby and the joy of being with their, her as a grandmother to, be, to share in this brilliant, wonderful experience of bringing a new baby into a family. And we watched together a documentary on TV on understanding the brain development of a baby. And I watched this documentary thinking, this is absolutely intriguing. It's fascinating, it's mesmerizing, and it's intimidating. I felt in that moment like I didn't know anything about what was required to stimulate the appropriate development of the brain. And I stepped back from that experience and thought, what is it that parents today are up against with the over-professionalization, particularly in recent times, of thinking about their role in the, their developing child's brain? There is increasing literature on what your children need from you to be happy and successful. So we're taking another little sideways track now to thinking about the developing goal of happiness for parenting. Stearns writes in a paper in 2019 that 73% of Americans rated happiness as the most important goal in raising children and assessing the results of education. And that this went far ahead of any other options. The second biggest option was the goal of children's success, but it was at 21%, not at the 73% of the goal that our children need to be happy. 
and this is replicated in other Western countries, including Australia. And can you guess which country parents had the highest percentage of the goal of their children being happy? It took me by surprise. It was France. Up at 86% of parents said that this was their primary goal in their parenting. As I consider more data on parent involvement, I've looked at some other research and just seen this pattern of intensification of parenting. An article in the British Journal of Sociology in 2014 brought out some fascinating data that in recent times, despite the time squeeze that many working parents of today face, parents are in fact devoting more time to childcare than the parents of the 1960s. What do you think of that? Back in the 1960s, this article says, the majority of mothers were at home then, full time, and they were supervising rather than directly involved with their children. Interesting to consider. And we've got the rise in more fathering involvement, which is a, a clearly a positive contribution. But, as another article writes, there's this cultural shift towards intensive parenting and the changing character of childhood and parenting is centered more and more on children's needs with methods that are informed by experts and they're labor intensive and they're costly for mothers and fathers alike. And that particular article was published in 2017 by authors Smythe and Craig who are here at the University of New South Wales in the Social Policy and Research Centre looking at family relationships and this shift in intensive parenting. I wonder what you're considering as you're thinking about what nurturing in the family looks like in this context of professionalising parenting advice over 100 years and much more intensity being developed in parenting across Western society and across socio-economic groups as well. I want to take a little step back now and just pause from all of this to consider parenting as nurturers as conveyed in Judeo-Christian tradition, as in conveyed in our scriptures. And I have this well-known verse from Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7, that I invite you to consider, just as a pause. And these words which I give you today shall be in your heart. You, you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. This presents an interesting idea of nurture and parents. What stands out to me is this is parenting with principles to live by, coming from the heart, taught to children in relationship, actively in relationship, not lecturing children, but living these principles, noting the words walking, lying down, sitting, rising through the domains of life. So considering where we're going with our parenting trends, how can we recover parent confidence in their capacity to help children grow and develop in character, in spiritual growth, and in their own learning. How do we figure out what nurture is in the family today? I'm not advocating a return to Victorian sidelining of children in the 19th century. I'm not wanting to sentimentalize the past, but I wanted to present tonight how confusing the
the context is for today's parents. Parenting, especially mothering, has become more and more an anxious endeavour characterised by pervasive self-doubt and guilt. The flip side of that are the parents who move from being over-involved in their, in, as they're trying to get parenting right, to parents who outsource at the first sign of their children showing difficulties and symptoms. And outsourcing to experts also serves a function for guilt-laden parents. And this is appearing in the literature as well that there's an anxiety reduction that comes through an expert diagnosis and treatment. And the implementation of biomedical accounts will diminish the stigma of bad parenting. So I think this adds to the complexity of how to help parents find their way back to a calm confidence that they are an important resource to their children's development. I'm going to now move back to the basics of children's emotional well-being. Yesterday I looked at the basics of understanding mental health and today let's look simply, let's reduce from the complexity right down to what is the essence of robust mental well-being and emotional well-being for children. You'll see in this next slide that Looking at the family context and its contribution to children's emotional regulation is vital. It's the essence of children doing better. Yesterday I talked about anxiety and fear-induced stress and the lack of resetting from that stress response. So nurturing that can help children to learn emotion regulation and good self-regulation from their loving caretakers who allow them to experience discomfort, delayed gratification, not getting their own way, moments of separation, but are consistently there to welcome them back and to show that they are focused on doing their parenting job to their best of their ability, not by trying to make their child happy, but giving their child the experience of managing stress in the world. And you can see from this article just how the literature is strongly linking emotion regulation with better outcomes for children moving into their adolescent years. Remember yesterday I spoke about the tend and befriend theory? That there is a fear response that goes beyond flight and fight and freeze and fret. It's the befriending and the fixing response. And I think this helps one to understand how a society that is really stressed and anxious about children is also going to be a society that is promoting this tend and befriend fear response in over-nurturing children. It's a physiological response, remember, where oxytocin combined with opioid hormones are activated in a fear response. And if your child is struggling, it is a natural physiological response to move into over-befriending and over-fixing and over-tending to a child. So it's so difficult for parents to reverse this and made even more difficult by the messages that they're getting about what children need to develop. My primary interest over the last couple of decades of my clinical work moving into my research is understanding what's involved in this intensive anxious parenting and what does it look like to move towards a calmer kind of nurture. What treatment approaches could facilitate this? And in this next slide, there's a quote from an article that I wrote back in 2008 
and the title of the article was We Don't Need Your Help But Will You Please Fix Our Children, published in the local family therapy journal. And what I outline here is the essence of understanding the problem of over-nurturing. That what it does is it crowds the emotional breathing space for a child to develop. If you think back to the pressure cooker during COVID lockdown, but we've got this intensive, anxious parenting. And it makes it very hard with intensity and over-monitoring or over-rescuing or over-problem solving for children to have the breathing space to develop at their capacities. Even children that do have genetic or biological issues and symptoms, the intensive over-focus will prevent them developing to their capacities. So I'm going to turn now to outlining my own doctoral research in this area and where it's taken me in thinking about the nurture of young people. And to cover it briefly, there's a lot to take on board, but I just want to give you a taste of it. What I did in my research is I interviewed parents at a tertiary treatment centre in Western Sydney at the beginning of their child's treatment and at different junctures along the way. So it was a longitudinal study over about a nine month period. And I asked parents about their experience of their involvement in their child's treatment. Beginning of treatment, discharge from treatment after a school term, and then a six month follow up. All of this data textual data thematically analysed, capturing the strongly emergent themes. I triangulated case records, clinician feedback and focus groups, just so that I could have a comprehensive overview of parent involvement in their treatment. And you can see from this summary here and published in 2018 in Clinical Child Psychology and Psychiatry, that they really Key, key finding was the influence of parent discovering agency on having sustained hope after their child's treatment, even if their child wasn't recovered. And in all of the cases of the parents that I interviewed, there were still symptoms six months after. There was symptom improvement for many, but still symptoms. So for parents to be able to be patiently there to be a resource for their child, they needed to discover their own agency. And in the next slide, it's a complex slide, but it paints a picture of the beginnings of the parent journey through my research process to the six month follow up and how parents moved to three different levels of hope, high hope, moderate hope and low hope. They all started from the same place. All these parents started expressing themes of helplessness, frustration, hitting dead ends, trying to find the right help for their child. At the beginning of the treatment, they also universally reported a, a spike in hope, but their hope was in the expert treatment that they were about to receive. And the referrers had all said, this is the place for your child. You're finally going to find the treatment that they need. So parents' hope spikes, but it's without agency. And the key journey of the parents whose treatment engaged them well, not with psychoeducation about understanding their children's symptoms better, but with the opportunity to explore the way they related to their child on a day-to-day -day basis and learn from the inside of that what they could adjust to be a better resource towards their child's recovery of well-being. I think it's an important finding for the field and um, I hope that there can be more research to expand on this and other types 
of research methodology, more quantitative research as well. So as a result of this research, I've been working more and more to develop interventions for parents that can help them develop this agency. And in the next slide, you can see something that is in my new parenting manuals that I've developed, but also in the little book on confident, confident parenting, is this common worry cycle that parents can read and say, I identify with getting into this cycle with my child, whether that child is a five-year-old or a 25-year-old still living at home. The worry cycle of the parent making, trying to be a help to their child and how they get caught in a cycle that seems to compound the worry. And I'm very interested in how treatment processes can replicate this same worry fo focus by making it all about fixing the child and not mobilizing the resources of parents to assist a whole family to recover more calm and the capacity to nurture well. Are there any, any indicators out there in the policy world of a shift away from medicalizing children's mental health, professional experts telling parents about brain development, a focus on diagnosing and treating children and parents either investing heavily in the diagnosis to help absolve them of the burden of guilt or being intimidated by the diagnosis and feeling that they're sidelined in the treatment process and don't know what's going on. Is there a move towards involving parents in a more helpful way where they can recover agency and hope? And I'm really encouraged to report that there is out there. And this particular report, the National Children's Mental Health and Wellbeing and Policy Report, released last year, acknowledges that parents, as well as many professionals, have difficulty navigating a fragmented service system. And there are long waiting lists for assessment and treatment for all but the most severe problems. And this report is saying we need a real shift in pol policy and delivery of services in the field. The strategy proposes a cultural shift, a fundamental cultural shift in the way we think about mental health and well-being of children. This shift, and I'm quoting the report, this shift includes a change in language, adopting a continuum-based model of mental health and well-being, this moves away from terminology that may be stigmatizing or too narrow to capture the full range of children's emotional experiences. And you can see from this diagram that there's, rather than diagnostic categories, a continuum of functioning with language that speaks to whole children, not labeled children. Now, having done research in this field, I do know that the lag time between new policy and the shift in services is large and discouraging. But this is policy to start speaking into. For those of you out there listening tonight who are in the field, there is a platform with these policy trends to speak into more involvement of parents in a positive agency generating way in their children's mental health treatment. And the report does recommend that Medicare items need to be amended so that parents and carers who come to consultations without their child can get a rebate. Currently they can't. If the child is not seen with the parent, they can't get a rebate. So this is one of the shifts being recommended.
So what does it take for parents to rediscover their nurturing confidence? Part of this is going to need this policy being fulfilled, where parent involvement is central to the treatment of struggling children. But it needs to be a kind of parent involvement that really does nurture parent agency. And I'm going to, as we're coming towards the end of this lecture, introduce you to the Parent Hope Project. That is my effort to develop an intervention program to be used with struggling parents who are worried about their children and to help clinicians take the parents on a journey of discovery of their agency, not to be instructed, but to be taken through the steps of exploration of their interactions with their child to find ways that they can make their own adjustments for the well-being of their children. So with the Parent Hope Project, it has two stages to it, a stage one which is called Stepping Back and three program areas that the parents are walked through. I've taken the language of my parents in my research to form this program and parents use the word stepping back all the time as being one of the most valuable experiences of their treatment involvement. These were the parents who recovered hope in their own capacities. They said how valuable it was to step back and to be able to get a little bit more objective rather than caught in that pressure cooker intensity. And in the stage two of the program and the next three sessions, parents are encouraged to experiment with stepping up and adjusting self, recovering their leadership, developing a stronger connection, not a worry connection, not connecting to the symptoms in their children or their projected worries for their, for their children, but connecting to the whole child and to finish with more patience for a gradual improvement. The more anxiety in society, the more we're looking for quick fixes. So the idea is that parents can be taken on a journey where they can renew their hope, renew a sense of direction and increase their confidence. And in developing this program, which is in its infancy, I've been piloting it with a number of professionals, but I have developed a website. I invite you to have a look at it. And I'm continuing to draw on feedback from others. But the website, the Parent Hope Project and the Parent Project is a social enterprise that I'm committed to going forward to help parents recover their agency and their calm and their confidence to nurture their children. I'm going to return now to the beginning case example as we come to the end of this journey tonight. Back to the Simpson family and their struggle with their second daughter. These parents courageously work to reduce their anxious focus on their daughter. Through talking through their interactions with their child, even some of the most intense interactions where self-harm was involved, they could step back and see the things that they were doing that were adding to intensity and reconsider them. They could address the tension in their parenting partnership. And it was another interesting finding of my research and looking at the literature around this, that wherever there is a child who is struggling, there are caregivers who are reacting to the ineffective efforts of the other parent or caregiver. And so you have this soft, hard split and polarizing and these parents started attending to that. And one of the shifts that they made was very interesting. The father started to voice his different views to his wife 
about how he would parent their daughter, not pushing her, critiquing her, or telling what, her what to do. But previously, he had been very fearful about expressing his different way of going about things, fearful of his wife's criticism. And he stepped up in the process to be able to say, we don't always have to be on the same page. He could see how anxious his wife was and how hard it was for her to pull back from rescuing. And rather than try and change her or change his child, he stepped up to start to change himself and in essence, bring some initiative in leadership to the family, which was very much welcomed by his wife after some initial reactivity. What this, these parents worked on was being connected with their daughter, not as a project to fix or rescue. It was slow change, and there was still a hospitalization after a overdose attempt in the process of treatment. And another thing to mention that I see in these families, this is a de-identified family, there are many stories that are similar. I see that these families have become cut off from broader resources. And this family I'm thinking of, we're in an intense environment of work that had them cut off from their extended family and their community. So one of the changes they started to make was reconnecting with broader community supports. They had put so much effort into connecting with professional treatment services that they had no time left over for connecting with community and connecting with their extended family. So let's summarize. Nurturing in the family, growth in development and learning. There is no simple formula to this. It's a huge challenge to adjust anxious, intensive parenting because society is fueling it and has been for a long time. Bowen wrote that the family's use of the medical structure of examining, diagnosing and treating is a monumental problem out there and there are no easy answers for it. But I hope tonight for helpers and for parents you have some ideas of some pathways towards calmer, more effective nurturing. For helpers, some ideas for you to consider. Is the way that you're helping promoting parent insight and agency, or is it probably inadvertently promoting passive investment in your expertise? Does your treatment fuel more anxiety and intimidation for parents, or does it help parents to calm down and to be less anxious and recover their confidence? Will your treatment facilitate parents being empowered to work on themselves rather than stay focused on trying to change or fix their child? And for parents, what can reduce the intensity around parenting your children? You've heard about not over-nurturing and the problem of it. And I would suggest considering pausing before outsourcing, working on calming self in the family, recovering confidence in managing what's in a parent's control. Anxious parenting moves into trying to control the child, which is outside of the domain of control for a parent. So consider what's within my control to say yes to, to say no to. Reconnect with the community. Parenting shouldn't be done in a pressure cooker of just within the walls of the nuclear family. Allow nurturing breathing space for children to develop in relation to, not in reaction to their carers. Remember that the parent is the project, 
not the child. When I speak to parents, as I often do at parenting seminars, I say, how will you, at the end of a day, decide whether you're on the right track as a parent? How will you assess it and measure it? Will you measure it by the mood and the behavior of your child on any given day? Or might you measure it by considering whether you've been more mindful of yourself and your principles as a parent? And I'll leave you with that thought tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. We'll have a formal vote of thanks in due course, but we now come to a time of questions. And sorry, I just need some optical assistance at this point. Sorry about that. Let's start at the very beginning. It is so easy to see these patterns in other people's families and so hard to identify or change your own. <laughs> Any advice on how to notice where I may be over or un under functioning in my family? I think that question is just a statement worth holding on to. <laughs> I don't need to comment too much. It is indeed, particularly when we're anxious, it's so easy to focus on others and how they're getting it wrong and not to be able to look at the, the plank in our own eyes, but to be able to look at self. And there's such value in becoming a better observer of self. And when you have to observe yourself, you have to go into your upper cerebral brain and really think. You can't be in your anxious brain when you're observing. So the effort to observe is so valuable, but to observe self rather than make a project out of critiquing others out there. This next one sounds like a professional question. What you have said last night and tonight, especially the quote from Bowen in the introduction, sounds a lot like RDI, Relationship Development Intervention, a therapy that works with families to help autistic children. Could you comment on whether you see them related and if there are any ways they differ? One of the great joys of doing these kind of presentations is I'm asked questions about approaches that I know nothing about. And this is one of them, and I had one of those last night. So I will be interested to have a look at that. And I'd, certainly these ideas are not exclusive to Bowen's family systems theory. As Bowen himself said, and any researcher or theoretician would say, they're not inventing these ideas. They're observing well and describing what they see. And I think, therefore, there'll be some good overlap with other approaches out there. Thank you. How can parents be using their instinct, I guess, in balance with expert advice well? It's another good question that I think makes a point without me having to add much to it, is thinking about balance. How do you use expert advice without giving up your own wisdom and instinct and capacity to think for yourself? It's a really good question. And I commend the question and the idea of looking for a balance, not a binary either or. Thank you. I'm interested in your thoughts on whether there are issues that teachers or schools are dealing with that are built better dealt with by families or parents. I'd love to have a dialogue with the person asking that question to get some examples to be able to answer it. I think it's a very interesting question about the whole idea of parents and families outsourcing the nurture of children and young people to schools as well as to professionals, and what's a good partnership between parents and educators and how to foster that. 
It's an excellent question. I think it deserves a lecture all of its own. Um, but I'm really glad it was asked to just lay out there again what goes into thoughtful partnerships. The one ingredient to developing good thoughtful partnerships of those who are involved in the nurture of young people is to take out anxiety. I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the lecture how much anxiety is in our frontline mental health treatment services at the moment, and it's not the place to develop thoughtful partnerships and relationships and working collaboratively. So anything that an educator can do to approach challenges with children and conversations with parents in a thoughtful way, being really interested in the parents' thinking and observations, getting beyond parents, venting their complaints to how are you managing that at home and being very sensitive to inviting parents to think and describe what they're doing, not just express stress and anxiety. So uh, it's a few thoughts to put out there, but it would be good to explore that further. Thank you. The next is a very direct question. What are your thoughts on a mental health service such as Headspace, designed to be accessible for young people, say 12 to 25 year olds? It often does not actively seek involvement from parents, but also Often the clients come from broken families where a parent may not willingly be involved. Yes, thank you for that question. I've had quite a good deal of involvement with Headspace and there are a lot of really fine policy principles behind the design of Headspace. For example, involving job seeking services, making it broader than treating symptoms in young people having a range of services about life functioning that I think Patrick McGorry has really got that right. Um, I have a lot of respect for his writing and his critique of the field that has gone behind Origin Youth Services and the Headspace Services. But the question is asking what do I think about their lack of involvement of parents and what do I think about many young people that come to those services coming from broken homes. Another big question that's hard to answer in the depth that deserves. But first of all, I would say that many young people who report coming from broken homes or report coming from families where they've had a falling out with their parents, when you get the opportunity to track the history and look at the broader context, it wasn't always that way. There were periods of time where parents and the young people had a more positive time, a more positive relationship, and a lot of youth services miss out on exploring that. They're working from the, the young person complaining about the challenges they've had with parents. And even with the many fam broken families, as you've referred to them, families, uh, large percentages of families have had separations and disruptions, but there are always resources there to be found. Always resources there to be found. There's a study that has stayed with me that I read about many years ago with adolescent young women who were in a group home cut off from their parents, serious mental health problems. And they did a research project of connecting these young people who were cut off from their families, appeared to have no family resources, and the research looked at connecting them with someone from their extended biological family, whoever it could be. Mm. And the symptoms in these young people improved profoundly as they were connected to members of their family. So I think that can be refound in the field, an exploration of bridging cutoff with broader family resources can, could potentially have a significant impact 
on young people doing better. Thank you. Thanks for your lecture, Dr. Brown. I was surprised that love did not feature in much of your lecture. In your framework of parenting, how would you distinguish between being nurturing versus, versus being loving parents? Are they the same thing? Love, it's a difficult word, isn't it? And parents, they don't really need to be instructed to love their children. It is a natural thing. There are very, very few parents who are genuinely unable to love their child through serious mental health and trauma conditions. But I've chosen deliberately not to talk so much about love, but to talk about parenting by principles. And I would say this is the best way to love a child. It's the outworking of love to be able to hold the discomfort of seeing your child upset and not rushing in to, to make them happy straight away, that this is what goes into truly loving a child and other person-centered parenting, not an anxious child-focused focus, but a parenting that is able to make adjustments and tolerate distress and discomfort for the well-being of the child's development. I think that's love in action but a very good question. Thank you. And I guess this, has a, this next question has a particularly Christian flavour. Jenny, how would you see Bowen's family systems theory fitting with a biblical view of family? I'm going to talk a bit more about that tomorrow and draw from some of the writing that I've been involved in with a group of people in looking at Bowen Family Systems Theory in Christian Ministry and drawing on a biblical lens and a biblical critique. But I personally, from my own Christian faith, have seen that much of Bowen theory is compatible with a view of humility, working on one's own gaps in maturity and character in order to be a better resource for others. So that particular piece of the theory resonates and sits well with the Christian faith. There are gaps in any secular theory, and I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, but that's one piece that for me I've thought a lot about, is just the humility of looking at self and being able to see how am I contributing to another person not doing well and to be able to not be crushed by that but to walk humbly along that path of growing more maturity to be able to love and serve others better. Thank you. As a pastor, I fear that kids and parents and individuals are learning to reserve their deepest truths for health professionals rather than each other as a married couple and a family. Any advice on how to encourage raw truths to be spoken to each other in helpful ways? These are such good questions, aren't they? There is the problem with many children seeing individual counsellors in under the um, the protective walls of confidentiality that leave parents wondering, what is my child talking about? And I wish I knew them better and could have access to their deep thoughts and their struggles and what they're fearing and what they're dreaming of. In order to reclaim that, I do think that mental health professionals working with young people can have a real rethink about how to invite parents to be able to connect with their child and hear more of what's going on for their children. But I also want to revisit the idea of non-intensive breathing space. Nobody opens up their deepest thoughts and feelings and dreams and fears and goals, all the things that are important in getting to know someone, we don't open up when we're being over-monitored 
and there's an intense worry focus on us. So if we want to cultivate members of a family being willing and naturally and spontaneously sharing more of themselves, we need to work at reducing the focus on trying to get people to open up. That's a kind of a monitoring focus and it doesn't work. But a calm curiosity and a willingness to share self as well as hear from children is a way of moving that in a different direction. Thank you. How much par parent anxiety is driven by high expectations in the community on what each child should be achieving? Oh, there is a big emphasis, isn't there, on an anxiety around performance and success and getting the right marks. And we've seen during lockdown and this pandemic just how disruptive the lockdown has been to anxiety about trials and exam results. It's, I think it's the air we're breathing at the moment in society as an anxiety about success and achievement. Although isn't it interesting the research that does say that at the heart of that is parents wanting their children to be happy and linking the two. So it's, it's a very good question to consider. I think of one of my sisters who's an educator in high school and has HSC students during lockdown, and she shared with me just how respectful she is of the way her students have adapted during lockdown. She sees their resilience and their capacity to be able to manage the setbacks without being crushed. And sometimes I think that it's the adults that are more crushed and that that is projected onto the children. So I think it's another excellent question. I can't do justice to these good questions, but I'm really grateful that it's just putting out there more food for thought for everyone listening tonight. Thank you. This next question is a bit of a fun one. Do you have any suggestions for the opposite situation where an adult child helicopter parents their parent? <laughs> um, that's a great question. It is a fun question, but it's also a very true question, and it isn't a fun situation to be in. And I meet a good number of young people who do feel responsible for caretaking their parents. Perhaps their parents have gone through a separation, they feel very concerned and aligned with one parent who's struggling, and they become quite parentified into their adult life and do feel responsible for a parent. So it can be reversed, and the principles remain the same. That the focus is moving away from worrying about and trying to change the other, not being responsible for the other and their life course, but being responsible for self in relationship to the other, rather than f taking on an over responsibility for a parent or for any other person. This, this question, next question looks like an opportunity for unashamed promotion. Many thanks, Jenny, for your wisdom. Would you say that the Parent Hope Project is only for parents with unwell children, or is it also for any struggling, un un underconfident parent? Mm -hmm. uh, that is an opportunity <laughs> for me to clarify the work that I'm doing in this area, so I don't know who asked that, but thank you very much. Could be a family member of mine. Um, it's a good question because Clearly, prevention is going to be very important to turning the tide around of intensive, anxious parenting. And so I think any program out there, the one that I'm developing, but other good programs and parenting resources need to be for prevention. So there is a program that is a parallel program called the Parent Confidence Program that is more preventative for a non-clinical group. 
and they're the parenting seminars that I've been developing over many years. I've had them professionally filmed and turned into seminars online, as well as putting free resources out there, blogs and podcasts, and I hope to add to that in the, the coming months and years so that parents, not just who are dealing with children at a, who are on the continuum of more symptomatic, concerning um, behaviors and challenges are being serviced by this. So thank you for that question. What is the role and the most beneficial way for a sibling to support another sibling struggling with serious mental health? And how does that individual assist other family members in this situation and the care involved? Great question, I think. It is an excellent question and a complex question. So my answer runs the risk of simplifying it, but a couple of principles to draw from. One is really good news. So I'm glad I have the opportunity to put this good news out there, that because family members are interdependent, we all affect each other profoundly. We're physiologically linked. There's a lot of co-regulation that happens, a lot of back and forth. Here's the good news. It only takes one member of a family system to start changing their level of reactivity, to start as it, the case example of the shift the father started making that helped draw other members of the family into progress. So anyone in a family, an adult sibling with a brother or a sister who's struggling can begin to work on connecting to their family member with some of the principles I talked about yesterday, treating them as a per person, not a patient, connecting with them in a thoughtful, side-by-side -side way, not a, not a over-helping posture with the struggling family member, to be able to stay in good contact with them and to partner with them in, in life functioning. That these are things that can make a real difference over time. So I wish you well with those endeavors, but the work is on self, not to change or fix the other. Thank you. Another rigorous question time. I think at this point I'm going to say these are the last three questions, right. if that's okay. Are there problems that arise from the opposite of hel helicopter parenting, parents who are too laissez-faire? Yes. Um, neglectful or laissez-faire parenting is a problem. But the one thing I would say for you to consider is that intensive parenting often leads to distancing from a child because of the stress levels. Do you remember yesterday I talked about how all humans use distance to relieve stress and discomfort? So a lot of parenting that is seen as not involved enough, not caring enough, detached parenting is often coming out of an intensity and a fusion where the parent can't tolerate the stress of their involvement, their emotional fusion with the child, and they use distance to cope with that. So it's one of the angles that Bowen's theory has given me to see that there's an intensity in parenting that appears to be more ne on the neglectful end of the spectrum, but it still has an intensity to it. And that degree of laissez-faire and stepping back and not being involved has a significant impact on crowding the breathing space of the child who is highly sensitive to their, their parents still. There's still a reciprocity and they're still affecting each other in a deep way. So it's a very good question, and there are different parenting styles, and over-involved parenting can 
have different valences. It can be overly critical or overly positive, but it is still crowding the breathing space of a young person. And I must say, I'll get this in, this is so important, the young person is an active participant in the process. It isn't a one-way street from the parent to the young person. The child is caught in the dance as well, and that's very important to recognise. Thank you. This new, the second last question comes from the light, delightfully named The Wombat. How do you balance a mentally Ill, Ill adult child's desire for privacy, denying parents access to mental health and other professionals who are caring for them, and the parents' desire to be involved? Parents' nurturing becomes a bit of a guessing game as they try to help. Great question, whoever Mr Wombat is, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, I couldn't resist the name anyway, Jenny, over to you. Yeah, it, it's, it's a sad question, isn't it? It's so hard for parents who genuinely care and want to be a resource for their child's recovery, whatever the age of their child, to feel shut out and to have the child shutting them out. And certainly trying too hard to pursue to try and get in is not going to be constructive. So there's no easy answer to that one. Patience, grace, staying in non-anxious contact with the child, knowing, letting the child know that you are interested and you're there and not becoming too anxiously pursuing to get in the middle of things. Our treatment um, approaches need to question the shutting out of parents and sidelining them, I think they're missing out on a very important resource for a young person's recovery, whatever stage of young adulthood they're at. Thank you. Last question. It's interesting that adolescent responses to anxiety are so different between girls and boys. Mm -hmm. Why is this? Is there a common cause behind these different expressions? It's so interesting to note the different expressions. And of course, there are uh, outliers to the, the variations in girls tending to be more internalizing rather than externalizing. But there are many young um, children and um, adolescent females who um, do oppositional behavior right up there with the common presentations of males as well. Um, there are so many complex factors in socialization in certainly the brain and hormonal biological differences between the genders that are part of this and looking at gene expression and um, the, the differences there. It's a complex area, it's a very good question. I'm not going to tackle it further than acknowledging the complexity and the variation. Good. Thank you very much, um, Jenny. I think I'll let you sit, stand down for a moment. And I'd like to invite Professor David Cohen, President of the Academic Board at the University of New South Wales, to come and move a vote of thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. I will be brief because, of course, uh, you and many of us will be back tomorrow night for the final instalment in the series. Um, it's been a very provocative lecture, and there's much for us to reflect upon. Um, current parents, future parents, and those of us who are looking back uh, and thinking whether we got it right. Uh, certainly the point before we um, hand our children over to the tertiary sector. Um, the day you presented on self-injury by teenagers is very disturbing, uh, especially the increase in recent uh, years, um, some related to COVID, um, and the home environment or the situations that can contribute to the problem. Hence, you've led us to uh, the question of addressing the source of the problem rather than just dealing with the consequences um, and drawing our attention to the responsibility of parents um, to uh, uh, at least trying to control levels of stress 
uh, or intensity in the home environment. Um, first year university can be the first great test of the balance in the household uh, between nurture versus independence uh, and whether uh, we have had children as projects. Um, I'm often amused at open days uh, when we observe whether it is the year 11 or 12 student or their parent who asks the first question at each of the booths. Still, the strength of universities stems from being academic nurturing communities. Hence, I very much look forward to tomorrow night's lecture on nurture in community. So at this point, again, I'll thank you very much for tonight's lecture. Thank you, David. Well, from me, as, as we wrap up this evening, just some very brief closing remarks. As I said last night, the New College communities make the New College lectures available for free as a service to Australian society. We are a not-for-profit organisation. If you appreciated this lecture this evening, you may wish to help us support the young people who will be part of the next generation of national leaders by making a gift to one of our scholarship funds. We are looking to increase our scholarship offerings as lockdown lifts and we can welcome domestic, both domestic and international students back to face-to-face -face university classes. You can visit our alumni and supporters page on our website. Any gift you would like to make will be greatly appreciated. Again, you might know someone who wants to come to the University of New South Wales next year. Excellent choice. And who would also benefit from living in one of our communities. If they quote the new college lectures, NCL 2021, to our admissions officer, we will waive our normal admission fee. Finally, the new, co new college also publishes its own quarterly journal called Case Quarterly. This journal attracts written contributions on contemporary issues from leading Christian thinkers across the globe. Special prices on subscription are available this evening. The link to do this was circulated with your registration but you can still just Google Case Quarterly, contact us, and take up the special subscription price. I hope to welcome you back tomorrow evening as we continue, our, continue and conclude our journey tomorrow night and consider nurture in community. Thank you and good night. <laughs>